Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fiona Sanderson, and I'm the marketing manager here at My HR Toolkit. Um, so, first of all, I'd just like to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, I can see we've got some customers with us today, um, but there's also lots of new faces um, here as joining us here as well today. So, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, so, I'll be handing over to our speaker very shortly, but I'm just going to run through some useful information um, and a bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started. Um, so, for those that, for those of you who are new to us, um, as well as our ongoing webinar program covering lots of different business topics, we um, provide a simple to use HR software system. Um, so, um, it gives basically it's specifically designed uh, for SMEs. Um, and it allows you to manage your core HR tasks in one place. So everything from your holidays and your sickness, um, your HR policies and documents, um, training and performance and everything that supports legal compliance. Um, we can do all of that. So um, if you're struggling to organize your HR in a way that saves you some time and money, um, we can definitely help you with that. So what we'll do is we'll put, put a link in um, to our website in the chat, uh, should you be interested in finding out a bit more about that. Um, now, so on to today's webinar topic. So today we're going to be learning about how law firms can embrace HR technology to support profitable growth. Um, so the things we'll be looking at is how it can help manage um, performance and training issues and um, how you can get staff on board with these new tech changes and how you can enhance your common strategies to with tech to ensure effective staff management in all areas. Um, so this, the, um, the presentation itself will last around 30 minutes um, and then we'll have a bit of time at the end uh, for your questions. Um, so we'll save those to the end. Um, but if you're new to Zoom, you'll see um, in the toolbar at the bottom, there's a Q&A box. So feel free to post your questions there um, and we'll address them at the end. Um, you could choose to remain anonymous if you wish. Um, so feel free to ask us anything and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. There's also a chat feature, so feel free to get involved with the chat, but just remember to post your questions to the Q&A box, um, so just so that we don't miss them. Um, there's also, oh, just to note as well that today's session is offering general, not legal advice, so it's based on the information we have available to us as of today. Um, if you're interested in finding out a bit more about our webinars, um, we'll pop a link in the chat. We've got one coming up on the 3rd of November, which looks at um, what if you're not Google? So attracting talent to your SME. So that's everything that, that in that webinar we'll talk about if you've got a limited budget, you haven't got a brand, how you can um, attract talent um, to your SME. So um, feel free to um, have a look at that. And we've, we've just popped a link in the chat right now. So, um, right, so on to our speaker. So just a bit of background information. And um, I struggle to condense this because um, she uh, has so much experience. So if I just go through, through what I've learned. So she's the Vice President of the Innovation in Law Studies Alliance. She's recognized by the International Legal Technology Association as one of the five most influential women in legal technology. She's the author of several books on innovation and legal tech. She's organized legal hackathons. She's created her own app, Conflict Map. And she's the managing partner of the Institute for Legal Innovation, a company specialized in supporting law firms in innovation and digital transformation projects. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you all to Maria Jesus Gonzalez Espejo. Good morning, Maria. Um, good morning. Just, so, good sorry, morning. technology was uh, <laughs> denying me the right to access, you know. It's uh, always uh, a challenge, you know, one of the challenges mm. we are all facing nowadays. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Fiona, for the introduction. No um, thank you for uh, finding me. Uh, and I'm happy to be here. Um, as you have seen, I have a very long name and pronounceable for most English speakers. So my <laughs> friends from the UK call me just yes, Maria, you know. Oh, and okay. You are a family name, you just take off the espejo, which means mirror in Spanish, and you call me Gonzalez, and then I will be answering for you. So I'm Maria for you. Okay. 
best with my language. I hope that you all understand me. So I'll try to speak slowly and I have my slides and they have been checked by an English speaker. So I hope that they are all fine. Shall I just uh, share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll hand over to you now and, and let you present your slides. Yes, I'll present my slides and um, let me find them. And I'm nearly there. Okay, I hope that you can see them. Yeah. One second, I'm going to presentation mode. I think it's there. Yes, okay. So you can all see it now. Uh, the title for today's presentation is How Law Firms Can Embrace Human Resources Technology to Support Profitable Growth. Something that we are all um, worried about you know, how can we grow? How can we be profit profitable? Can technology help us? How can it help human resources management? So thank you, my toolkit, and thank you to Law Consultancy Network, of which I make part, for, for having me as a speaker today. I hope uh, we enjoy this half an hour, and of course, I will be more than happy to try to answer all the questions that are asked by the audience at the end. So the agenda, it's simple, we have um, three parts. The first one is called the five new challenges uh, for uh, human resources in law firms. The second one is the solutions for these new challenges. And finally, I will uh, propose some conclusions. So let's jump into the five new challenges that I have identified as, as, as let's say the most serious for human resources at present. I don't know if you read like I did some uh, months ago, not so long ago, this um, a news published by the BBC, but in also many other newspapers, such a news was published where they stated the following uh, incredible uh, situations. Microsoft made a survey uh, with over 30,000 uh, global workers. And what it showed is that 41% of those workers were considering quitting or changing professions this year. Amazing, it's nearly half. A UK uh, human resources over company uh, also published a report and in the report, they showed that 38% of the survey people plan to quit in the next six months to a year. So a similar number. And in the US alone, April saw more than 4 million people quitting their jobs. These are really amazing data. And this has been called the great, great resignation. I do not want to work here anymore. But why do people think I don't want to work here? Well, I guess that several reasons could be explaining this situation. People have had to time to think and the result of this introspection has been, I want to move, I'm not happy here. Also, Many people have time to enroll online training and they have probably acquired new skills and knowledge that allow them to think of a different future. But also the pandemic precipitated a shift in priorities, encouraging people to pursue a dream job or transition to being a stay at home parent. And also I think that not all employers behave properly during the pandemic. And this has probably influenced um, the, the, the mindset of uh, many uh, workers. So here there is the first challenge. I think that many companies, many organizations, many law firms are facing at the moment. How do I retain people? Let's jump into the second challenge. I do not want to work on site. So we have been working online and now suddenly we have to go back to the office. So there is this study of Prudential that says that one in three American workers would not want to work for an employer that required them to be on site full time. As you can see here in the picture, 87% uh, was uh, working remote, wants to work remotely at least one day a week. On the other side, for employers, it has been quite hectic, quite difficult. And they're not so happy with uh, everybody working at home. And they refuse it because, you know, they're afraid of losing engagement with the company. 
they want to control because they have the feeling that they don't know exactly where people where people are up to. It is also difficult for them to train and communicate effectively, etc. So there it comes the second challenge I think many organizations are facing at the moment after the pandemic. Shall we go on site, online? Shall we go hybrid? How can we make our teams happy? How can we make our companies be profitable and efficient? Let's jump into the third challenge. When the pandemic, one of the problems that arose was boundaries between personal life and professional life. People are very much concerned about it because suddenly we got at home and we were in bed and we were working and we were feeding our kids and we were working. So we are all quite scared of this, let's say, a sudden imbalance, what seemed to have been probably the opportunity for us to have a better life has finally derived in that it is not always the case. But also on the side of the employer, uh, they need permanent contact. How can they keep in touch with their teams? How can they know how the team feels? And knowing the feeling of the teams is essential. So there comes challenge number three. How do I keep in touch with employees but respect their rights and work-life balance? And uh, another challenge comes from the need to have leaders that can run their organizations leading them correctly. We were used to a presential leadership, which has little to do with an online leadership. We need people who can communicate properly, but now let's say that nonverbal skills are different when we go online than when we are presential. So we need different kinds of communicators. Also in the online world, beside video and conversations uh, through video conference, we use a lot the writing. And through writing, very often we get misunderstood. Uh, let's think about WhatsApp groups. Let's think about emails. So there is a big challenge there. Second, motivators, because distance being at home, far away from the company, far away from my team, far away from my boss, it makes it more difficult to be motivated. So for leaders, being able to motivate has become a new challenge. Virtually empathetic. We all know the importance of empathy and I'll give you some data now after um, this slide on, on empathy and the role of empathy in companies and organizations. So uh, how, how can I be virtually empathetic? Highly organized. I mean, we had to be organized already in the presential, in the on-site um, work. But now, in the online work, this is even more necessary. People cohesive. How can I make people stick and become a group and feel part of the company? This is a new challenge when they are far away from me, when they are not every day seeing each other, talking to each other, enjoying having coffee together. Creativity. How I deploy creativity? How do I get people to share knowledge? That is also not so obvious because we learn a lot from each other. And when we are together, we share information, but in distance, how can we foster that? Visionary more than ever. We saw how the pandemic came, nobody expected it, but we have been seeing constantly um, factor, fa factors that are impacting our sectors or companies uh, so we really need people who are have a vision on the future who are really updated on trends and are constantly um, 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 informed and confident confident in themselves but also able to trust in others that that that, that, that is what i mean when i say confidence if uh, trust is not there um, there is very little we can do for organizations nowadays so this is what I want to mean with this slide. Uh, and this is, I think, a really interesting um, challenge. How do I find a balance between control and trust? Um, in the on-site uh, work style, it was much easier 
but how can I control people who are working from home? Uh, do I use devices to um, see if they are looking at their computer or doing something in their computers? Um, do I oblige them to register their timetables? What kind of tools are really effective working and not making people feel um, um, uh, supervised in a, let's say, violent uh, manner? There is this survey um, by Business Solver of 2021 this year, which found that only one in four employees think that empathy in the organization is sufficient. That is really a sad data. And uh, this is also a sad data, not only because of what it means for the employees, which probably do not feel very happy when they say that, but also because for 84% of the CEOs, they, uh, they consider empathy uh, a, a very important uh, factor to, uh, for better business outcome. So uh, lack of empathy, how can we be more empathy? So this is then for me challenge number four. How can we effectively lead people in this new working context? How can we get better leaders, better tele-leaders, better online leaders, how can we have more empathetic uh, leaders? How can we get people to collaborate, to share knowledge, to, um, to be compromised, engaged with uh, the company? So there it comes uh, technology. And technology is being used for very many things. It's being used to control, is being used to understand the reasons behind events, decisions. Here I'm talking about big data, about AI, about identifying patterns, identifying relations between things. Third thing that the technology can do for, for human resources teams is inform and communicate effectively. It can surely help us to be more efficient in communication. In fourth, the fourth place, training. In the fifth place, to be better organized. In the sixth place, to attract talent. We talk about this, uh, this situation um, of, of people leaving. Okay, this, this can help us to attract and, and also to retain talent, to have talent staying with us. And then finally, and, 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 and least but not last, last but not least, excuse me, to do things legally. So um, contracting in an automatic way so that we can have a, a nice contract management system, compliance, uh, something that um, is helped by, by, by a good management of, of documentation, data protection, uh, etc. So these are all the nice things that technology can do, but be aware that technology, and we all know that, come with several very worrying um, uh, things. One thing that can um, uh, bring technology is dehumanization. And I will give you a nice example of, of this. The second thing is resistance to change. So what if people do not like this technology and they do not use it? And as I always say, a lot of law firms do like buying technology and placing it on a drawer and just forgetting about the technology. Um, and that cannot happen. This should not happen. Then there is this big problem that is, uh, that is being faced at the moment by many organizations. I call it the digital skills gap. And finally, the ethical and the legal risk that entails the use of technology. And that is already placing law firms in very delicate position. We just had the last example uh, with this uh, Papiro case, and we had it with the Panama Papers, but we more or less have one of these cases probably every week. Many cases, of course, they don't get to the media, but they are there. I have plenty of clients who have got cybersecurity attacks and have lost all their documents. So here is this example I wanted to mention to show um, how, how can technology um, make organizations less human, less human-centric. Last August, you probably know, 
about this Shola, the Russian subsidiary of a software and interactive service company, which is in Los Angeles, fired 150 people out of its 400 people staff. And they did it basically based on it solely on the verdict that an algorithm mm -hmm. uh, set. And uh, this came into the media, and there has been a lot of discussion. In fact, I was contacted by a journalist who wanted to, me to give the, my opinion if this could happen here in Spain. And um, well, uh, of course, this can happen in Spain and anywhere. I mean, algorithms can, can really help to identify who is working and who is not working the way we have set up certain KPIs um, in, in the software. So. Um, is, a, is, a, is an employer entitled to use these kind of tools? Well, I, I guess they are. Um, what probably is not nice is that um, this is the only, um, let's say, um, source that is used to take the decision and probably the way they did it and the way they communicated. They probably wanted to position themselves as a nice software company. They became very, very known thanks to this, but I mean, it's really sad to think that um, companies can behave this way with their employers. Um, so talking about resistance to change, the second challenge I mentioned, um, what is clear is that for a lot of people, it's, it's hard to get out of their comfort zone. They don't want to change routines. And besides, they are, they are, fear, they are fear of losing their jobs. And of course, for many of them, the problem is not that, but is that they lack skills and they don't feel uh, ready to embrace these new uh, technologies. There is sometimes as well, uh, the problem of misinformation, people chatting around and not having the right information. And the problem there is clear is that the management is not communicating properly what is going to happen. And finally, the lack of time. I mean, we have the tendency to uh, introduce technology and to ask people to learn about it without thinking that this might take some time and we probably need to take work from them, tasks from them so that they can devote the necessary time to learning these new technologies. Regarding the digital skills hub, we should be aware that not everyone is capable of embracing the digital trend. Thus we may have, uh, may end up having two different group of workers, the ones who are in, they have a digital mindset and the one that do not have this digital mindset. And this is something that a company cannot assume. So uh, before getting into uh, digitalization, into a transformation, let's think about this. And then finally, I already mentioned the ethical and the legal risk. Uh, and this is one of the things that really scares me more when talking about technology and is that we don't think very much about the risk and very, very often there are problems with data protection, with cybersecurity, also with um, company secrets, which are breached and, and disclosed, et cetera, et cetera. So this is challenge number five. How can we use technology to manage people in a positive way? So with this um, last slide, I finished explaining the five challenges that I have identified as key at the moment for human resources teams in law firms. But let's talk now about three solutions for these new challenges. There they are. So one solution could be innovation. We have new challenges, therefore we have to find new solutions. Second, we have seen already that this is all about people and we have realized during the pandemic that people should be in the center. Let's make this assessment true. Finally, technology used in the proper way. Let's go by one, by one looking at, the, at these three pillars. Innovation. As I was saying, new challenges need new solution and innovation is the clear answer to solve them. But innovation, this has been studied, doesn't flower everywhere. It flowers essentially in an organization where failure is accepted. It doesn't matter 
if you don't do it right the first time. It doesn't matter if you fail even a second time, you know? Hierarchy. Hierarchy should be put aside, at least a little bit, at least for the teams who are going to be working in innovation. Law firms have the problem that in most cases are super hierarchical, and that is impeding people from creating, from innovating. Flexibility. Law firms are used to work in a legal framework. It's a framework, it's rigid, it's law. But creativity, innovation, flowers, better, blossom. I think you say blossom, not flowers, but okay. Blossom better in, in a flexible environment. I hope that so far so good. I, I keep on going. So people in the center. People in the center means that we need to ask people how they feel. We need to get feedback more than ever. We have always needed it, but now we need it more than ever. We need to actively listen and concentrate on emotions. And we don't need to assume that everyone is okay. And so your team that you really, really care. This is putting people in the center. Let's talk now about the third pillar. Technology. Technology should never be a goal, but a means, a means to do things quicker, to do things with more security, to do things, um, let's say, remotely, but not really um, a, a goal. People and technology have to match. So when choosing technology, be sure that the users like it. A user should check the technology. It cannot be a purchase done alone by the tech people. It has to be a crowd decision. And train people to understand how the technology works. Please remember that machines are not empathetic. We human beings are, but machines are not. And of course, technology should respect law. So do compliance of the technology whenever you decide to buy one. And this is my last, last slide and just three conclusions. First of all, technology and the pandemic are clearly having a great impact on the world market and people management. And this is happening in all sectors. And of course, in ours, the legal one. There are several challenges derived from both phenomena. What influences people's job choices is varying. So people are looking really at their lives. They are starting to try to design their future and their lives. And of course, films can, firms cannot look um, to the other side. They have to evolve and put people in the center. So strategies and policies should always have them in the center. Try to innovate, try to put technology, but always with people. And look for solutions that respond to the real challenges in people's management and that are easy to use. User experience should be excellent, otherwise people are not going to use the technology. These kind of technologies can help you to attract people, to retain the right talent, and consequently to support the Profit a profitable growth for your firm. With this, I'm done. And um, this is my data in case anyone uh, wants to uh, contact me. Um, I'm in Spain, but of course I'm working online with um, many countries, so uh, happy to help. And now um, I'm open uh, for any question, any comment. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, so you can, okay, yes, see me. And I'm uh, here ready for any comments. Of course, you don't have to agree with what I have said. Maybe you have other challenges that you have identified. Please feel free to share them with me. Maybe you have other solutions that you want to comment. So please, the mic is open for anyone. Thank you so much, Marie. We're just going to run a quick poll, actually, before we go to the questions. So um, if we could just uh, run that, just really to gauge how many 
how many people are actually using um, HR technology. So we thought we'd run that before, before we go into some questions. Do we have that? Oh, we could go into some questions before if, oh, bit of a technical glitch. Should we just, what we'll, what we'll do first is we'll, um, we'll, we'll go to the first question. We've got a few, a few coming in here. So if I just start with the first question. So how could artificial intelligence help law firms with HR in the future? Okay, well, artificial intelligence um, could be help for many, for many um, goals. Um, one clear goal is um, identifying uh, information that can be useful to define um, the strategies and policies of law firms. So as we all know, we are capable of, um, let's say, looking at a few data and we are not capable as human beings, most of us, unless you are gifted in math and, and in other um, top, uh, disciplines, we are not able to identify patterns, but technology is. So technology can be useful, for instance, to identify uh, people who um, are, let's say, in risk to leave the company. That is being done by, I know a bank here, Banco Bilbao Vizcaya had a problem of retention and they're using um, artificial intelligence to identify that kind of trend. Uh, to identify, you can also um, identify, of course, uh, profitability patterns. Uh, you can identify anything which has to do with the, let's say, the economy and the um, uh, profitability of your employers, of your employees, excuse me. So all which has to do with let's say um, KPIs, patterns, trends, and uh, of course, having information helps you to take more informed decisions. Uh, so that would probably be, let's say the most useful um, uh, way to um, take profit of artificial intelligence and its potential. Of course, you can use artificial intelligence to make lawyers' life easier. Uh, artificial intelligence has many subcategories, but expert systems, for instance, are fantastic. And they're not so much used. I mean, we have gone into the era of machine learning and even deep learning. And um, 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 uh, excuse me, in English is uh, um, natural language but uh, we are denying the power of expert systems. And expert systems are super interesting for um, many um, processes uh, that law firm um, do in a repetitive way and that um, could save tons of money to the firm and uh, guarantee security in the answer and facilitate clients' life. So, um, uh, there are other tools, of course, like um, the, the, the tools that help litigation people to understand um, the probabilities of um, winning a case. Uh, there are the tools that help the people, emanate uh, people to um, uh, do due diligence in an easy way. Uh, the tools that can um, uh, help um, people negotiating contracts and, and um, and analyzing contracts. So we have at the moment a plethora of um, tools. Um, so yes, I think human resources should be looking at artificial intelligence as a category of interesting tools for the company. Thank you. Okay, um, before we go on to the next question, I've been told the poll is now ready. So if we can just run with that and... Okay, so yeah, do you currently use tech to help manage your HR? Okay, if I just go to the second question. So <clears throat> this is going back to um, your slide where you were talking through 
the challenges and um, you mentioned the digital skills gap. How can law firms address that? Okay, well, of course, with the traditional training program, um, identifying which are exactly the skills they need, are they methodologies like legal design thinking or project management, are they uh, knowledge on different kind of technologies such as blockchain, AI, are they more skills to um, work in teams, etc. So the digital mindset means a lot of things. So first thing is identify what are the uh, subjects that um, lawyers need to acquire. I would create a program for, for um, the people who are missing this knowledge, who do not have enough qualification. But then there is an interesting um, solution, which I was told about uh, some weeks ago, which is called like uh, the inverse mentor. Uh, very often, uh, young people are more qualified than the uh, oldies. So what some firms are doing is that the young uh, lawyers are mentoring older lawyers. And I think that that's a really interesting uh, way to, um, let's say, uh, tackle this challenge. Um, because it puts together a young and old people uh, to work. And that is always something very interesting. And what could happen with this kind of uh, relation is that uh, while the young person knows about technology, maybe the old one knows about law more than the other one. So they can, you know, create interesting uh, synergies there. So that would be my suggestion. Okay, um, and at the moment we've just got one final question. So uh, what kind of um, new roles do you see in the future in law firms and where can I find them? Okay, the new roles. The new roles are probably those that are, let's say, not um, covered at the moment. They do not exist or they have, yeah, they do not exist but are necessary. Which are the ones that are necessary? Okay, let's see. First of all, data. Uh, law firms have denied uh, for many, many years that data was relevant to manage their, their companies in a better way and to do things better in general. So having data scientists, I think is something quite interesting for uh, law firms. Um, a second uh, kind of profession could be uh, processes uh, experts or legal design services experts. So people who understand about uh, legal processes and can define them and can identify bottlenecks and can, and can um, propose new ways uh, to do things. So that is a second, uh, let's say, set of professionals that I think that could be very interesting for law firms. Um, a fair one, of course, could be um, designers of solutions. So once you understand your processes, you can start designing uh, things. You can design new services. Um, you can design new processes, as I said. You can design new ways of uh, doing things, um, etc. And for that, you need designers. Uh, you can call them legal designers or designers or people that are a hybrid between, um, let's say, designing, law, marketing, and probably technology. Then uh, you also need a category of um, uh, programmers, de software developers, or tech people that um, can be front end, back end, uh, the ops or people that understand about technology and can make um, uh, le legal tech uh, solutions for for the law firm. Um, of course, um, if you want to get into fields like uh, artificial intelligence, maybe you are going to need experts in ethics, um, experts in um, sociology, and experts from other disciplines that are not law, but are but that are very much linked to this kind of new technologies. Um, well, I, I already gave enough examples, I guess, no? Um, I could keep on thinking, but um, these are probably the most relevant ones. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. So, um, yep, that's everything. So, just like to thank you for your time and expertise today, Maria. Um, it was really great to have you have you here, and I'm sure our participants got a lot out of it. So, yeah, big thank you from us. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you very much, Camille. And of course, uh, my presentation will be available for anyone. I'll be sending the, my PDF to you immediately so you can uh, send it to, um, to the participants. Fantastic. Yeah, the recording will also be available. Um, and also, yeah, if you're interested in, I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> our next webinar. So if you're interested in attracting talent to your SME and finding out a bit more about that one, um, we've just popped the link in the chat. Uh, um, for you to register to that one but we'll be sending out all the details of today's webinar to everybody um, so yeah that's it from us so thank you very much <laughs>